Hello, once again, this is your boy Kamal, and today we have an interesting infinite series at hand. We're defining the sum S as the sum over the integers k from 2 to infinity of zeta k divided by alpha to the k. So we're evaluating the sum in terms of a parameter alpha, and the alpha parameter here is supposed to be greater than 1, and this is the Riemann zeta function for the real part of S being greater than 1. Okay, fool. So how exactly do we approach this infinite series? Well, one thing we could do is expand it as zeta 2 by alpha squared plus zeta 3 by alpha cubed plus zeta 4 by alpha to the fourth power. And then, you know, plug in various values of alpha and then sum up to like maybe a billion terms or something like that. And then approximate the final result. Yeah, that would be fun. But we're going to try something else. We're going to make use of a very interesting functional relationship between the zeta and the gamma functions that I did derive a long while ago. That was during the early phase of the channel. Shout out to all of my subscribers who are now over 50,000. You guys are amazing. And in case you're new to the channel, you're not a subscriber, then just hit that subscribe button. I mean, isn't this infinite series enough motivation? I, I do stuff like this, man. I mean, man and woman. So I, yeah, I do stuff like this. So, you know, Hit that button as hard as you can. Anyway, so, uh, what is that functional relationship between the zeta and gamma functions? Well, we have zeta k times gamma k equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 dx divided by e to the x minus 1. And this implies that zeta k equals 1 by gamma k times the integral from 0 to infinity of x to, sorry about that, x to the k minus 1 divided by e to the x minus 1 dx. And gamma k is supposed to be k minus 1 factorial, so that means we have 1 by k minus 1 factorial times the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the k minus 1 divided by e to the x minus 1 dx. This is an integral representation for the Riemann zeta function. And I do integrals for a living, so it makes sense to evaluate an infinite series in terms of an integral. So we have our sum s sub alpha equal to the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of 1 by alpha to the k times this new version of writing the zeta function. That's 1 by k minus 1 factorial times the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the k minus 1 divided by e to the x minus 1 dx. Now because these two outside the integral are independent of the x variable with respect to which we're integrating, so we might as well just slip them inside the integration operator and we have the sum over k of 1 by, wait, 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 the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the k minus 1 divided by k minus 1 factorial times alpha to the k times 1 by e to the x minus 1 dx. Now we switch up the order of the integration and summation operators and now write this as the integral from 0 to infinity of the sum over k. Why is this so hard to write despite so much practice? The sum over k of x to the k minus 1 divided by k minus 1 factorial times alpha to the k times 1 by e to the x minus 1 dx. Now, here's the thing. The x to the k minus 1 divided by k minus 1 factorial term, that's obviously dependent on k, and so is the alpha to the k term. But not this term over here. This thing is independent of the index variable k, so we might as well take it outside the summation operator, and we have the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 by e to the x minus 1 times the sum over k of what exactly do we have? I want to take one alpha term outside from here, so that would just be a constant multiple of 1 by alpha. Then I'm left with x to the k minus 1 divided by alpha to the k minus 1, divided by k minus 1 factorial, and we have the whole thing being integrated with respect to x. Now, why exactly did I write the 1 by alpha term outside? Well, I now have x to the k minus 1 divided by alpha to the k, to the k minus 1, which looks a bit 
nicer, I guess. I mean, we have the same exponent, so... And we have the same thing as the argument of the factorial function, so yeah, it does look pretty nice and clean. But there's a more important reason for that. Let me perform a transformation of the index variable, and let's just transform the color. So we're going to let k minus 1 equal to n. So this means that s sub alpha is 1 by alpha times the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 by e to the x minus 1 times the sum. Now, when k equals 2, then n equals 1. So the sum is now over the positive integers of x divided by alpha to the n divided by n factorial dx. Okay, cool. Now, this thing over here is quite useful, the infinite series that we have. It's quite useful. Why is it useful? Well, recall the series expansion for the exponential function. We have e to the t equal to the sum over the non-negative integers, starting at 0, of t to the n divided by n factorial. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do is replace t by x over alpha. In that case, we have e to the x by alpha equal to the sum, starting at 0, of x by alpha to the n divided by n factorial. But the sum that we have starts at 1. So we're going to just evaluate the n equal to 0 term real quick, and that's going to be 1 divided by 0 factorial, which is, of course, 1. So this implies that, again, very, very hard to write. This implies that the sum over the positive integers n of x by alpha to the n divided by n factorial equals e to the x by alpha minus 1. And all of this implies that the sum s sub alpha equals 1 by alpha times the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 by e to the x minus 1 times our new term here is e to the x by alpha minus 1 integration with respect to x. Now this integral is pretty easy or relatively easy to evaluate and to turn it into something familiar we're going to make a substitution. We're going to let e to the negative x equal u which implies that e to the x actually equals 1 by u, and this further implies that we have negative e to the negative x dx equal to du, or dx equals negative du divided by e to the negative x being u, so we have the u variable down here. Okay, now as x approaches infinity, we have e to the negative x approaching 0, so u approaches 0, that's our, upper, that's our new upper limit. And as x approaches 0, we have u approaching e to the 0, which is, of course, 1. And this e to the x by alpha term would be u to... It would be 1 by u to the 1 by alpha. That is u to the negative 1 by alpha. Okay, cool. So this implies that the sum s sub alpha equals 1 by alpha times the integral now from 1 to 0 of... What exactly do we have? All right, we have u to the negative 1 by alpha minus 1 divided by 1 by u minus 1 times 1 by u du with a negative sign outside because of the differential element. And some simplification in the denominator is in order. We can write this as 1 by u divided by u, cancel out the u's, and we switch up the order of the limits of integration. That introduces a negative sign, cancels out the negative outside, but we reintroduce that by switching up the order of the terms in the numerator. So we have negative 1 by alpha integral 0 to 1 this time, of 1 minus u to the negative 1 by alpha divided by 1 minus u du. Now, this is a very nice integral that we can, whose result we can express in terms of a very special function. That is the digamma function. So let me just present to you the integral representation of this digamma function. We have digamma z plus 1 equal to negative order mascheroni plus integral 0 to 1. 1 minus u to the z divided by 1 minus u du. 
So all we need is z equal to negative 1 by alpha, and we can express the result of our infinite series. So we have s sub alpha equal to negative 1 by alpha times Euler mascheroni plus di gamma 1 minus 1 by alpha. Now obviously we can generate some interesting results using various values of the alpha parameter. As long as they're greater than 1, for example, alpha equal to pi, alpha equal to e, sure, they seem pretty cool. And they give you this nice result involving some beautiful constants. But I think, just personal opinion here, that the result involving the golden ratio is really nice and compact. So if we let alpha equal to phi, this implies that s sub phi equals negative 1 by phi times the order mascheroni constant plus the di gamma function at 1 minus 1 by phi, which of course can be simplified as 1 minus phi divided by phi. And we know what equation, no wait, this is phi minus 1 terribly, sorry about that. I don't know much algebra. Anyway, so the golden ratio satisfies this equation where phi squared minus phi minus 1 equals 0. And if you divide the whole thing by phi, we get phi minus 1 minus 1 by phi equal to 0, which implies that phi minus 1 equals 1 by phi. So multiplying this equation by 1 by phi would give us 1 by phi squared. So this, so this implies that s sub phi equals negative 1 by phi times order mascheroni plus the di gamma function evaluated at 1 by phi squared, which is a really neat looking result. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. And if you can, if you feel like you're learning something and you like the effort I'm putting out, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. All links in the description box. Thank you. See you next time.